Um, I'd like to, to introduce and, and welcome Claire, Claire Cotter, who, um, uh, as Andrew has said, has been, you've been heavily, heavily involved in the development of the, of the framework. So I, I certainly look forward to hearing more about the detail, and I'm sure everybody else is as well. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Hello, and uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, I flew in yesterday afternoon and I've been extremely well looked after and um, feeling very welcome here in Scotland and just uh, it's excellent to see so many people turn out for a day to talk about workforce you know I think that's that bodes very well I think for, for us all so um, it's really good to be here um, as um, has been ex has already been explained that there's there's I won't talk about myself too much because you've got it there in front of you if you if you're wondering that you're picking up an accent and you're trying to place it while I'm talking and it becomes a distraction um, I hail from the Welsh Valleys so I'm a fellow Celt but here with a PHE hat on representing uh, the work that that we've been leading on at PHE um, commissioned by the DH so it'll be all about the framework so. Um, it's great to be here. Can I just quickly ask, um, can, if you can just raise your hand if you were at the, the consultation that we carried out in the spring of 2015 around the framework. Oh, okay, so we've got a few of you, but um, a lot of new people. Can I just ask quickly, just raise your hand if you're um, aware of the original framework um, from 2008. Okay, so more of you. Um, and can I just ask a final question about who in the room either manages staff or recruits staff or is involved in the recruitment process? Okay, so I'll, I'll, even more again. So if I can just leave that question with you because I think if you, if you think about the framework in your capacity as either a manager or a recruitment officer, sometimes that, that can help you to think about um, future application, which is hopefully where we'll be going eventually. Uh, towards the end of the day. So, the, wh why did we review the framework? Where did this come from? So, this, it, this kind of started with um, the, the big shift in 2012 in England with the Health and Social Care Act, where quite radically a lot of our public health workforce were moved into local authorities. So the 152 top tier uh, or unitary authorities where the directors of public health now have statutory duty uh, within local government. So that, that was quite a major upheaval, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, that's not all the councils in England, but with the districts and boroughs, you're looking at over 400. And where there are different tiers of local government, our environmental health officers, um, are in those <coughs> district and boroughs. So you really are looking at quite a fragmentation of the public health workforce. We've also got the new Public Health England organisation that actually absorbed about 70 organisations, including the Health Protection Agency. So we have now a public health workforce with multiple employers, um, and it's already been mentioned about other agencies and organisations having their own frameworks. So when we came to look at the public health skills and knowledge framework, it was with, with our eyes open in the knowledge that there are already a plethora of frameworks, so why do we need another one? So we've been very mindful of that, and hopefully that will explain in part why it looks how it does at the moment. So we had this workforce strategy, came out a year after the Health and Social Care Act, and because of the um, public health workforce in the councils, it was the local government association, Public Health England and the Department of Health that put the workforce uh, strategy together. But when it came to the two um, deliverables, the review of the framework to make it reflect the new landscape and the second deliverable that's linked to the framework, which Andrew's already mentioned, the skills passport, they, um, the, the skills passport was sort of a slightly Anglo-centric uh, tool, but the framework, of course, belonged to everybody across the UK because it was first written in 2008 as the Public Health Skills and Career Framework. So if we were going to do anything with the framework, clearly we had to embrace our partners in the, in the devolved nations. We had to do this collectively and make sure that they were happy with what uh, we might be thinking about doing and were full participants in that process. We have a whole range of other 
partners on our steering group. So we've got the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health, the faculty, the Association of Directors, the Royal Society of Public Health, we, Health Education England, which is the, um, the new organisation in England, which is a bit like your NES, I think, here in Scotland, um, and the UK Public Health Register. So, um, and others, the, there are other groups trying to engage the voluntary sector, for example. So we have um, all of these agencies involved and have been involved quite very actively, uh, in fact, in the redesign of the framework. And we also commission Skills for Health to try and map what you see in front of you today on your tables. There is another level. Um, they mapped the framework to the national occupational standards that relate to those different functions. So if you wanted a deeper level of granularity, it's there. But um, to be honest, I don't think we've had a lot of engagement at, at quite that level yet. Uh, but the work's been done. So a lot of you will remember the original framework. Um, it looked like this, the cube. Um, you've got the nine levels of the workforce. Um, and even though a lot of the time we talk about the levels of the public health skills and knowledge framework, those levels are in fact the, um, the key elements of a career pathway defined by skills for health. So those nine levels are not unique to, the, to public health or the public health framework. And that, that, is, that still exists. You can still access that on the internet. So if you wanted to know what is expected of anybody working at any of those levels, th that tool still exists. Um, and then you have the nine areas of the Faculty of Public Health Curriculum. So the original framework was very much geared around a curriculum. Um, and of course, since, since then, the faculty have revised the curriculum. So now we have the two, 2015 Public Health uh, Faculty Curriculum, um, which has 10 areas, in fact, and not the nine. So there, there were instructions that came with the original framework. Um, the, the idea was that it was cumulative, so you might start at level one and work your way gradually to the top, um, to level nine, possibly, that by implication. It, it's cumulative levels of competence and knowledge. Uh, and it was cross-referenced against the nine areas of the public health curriculum, the idea but which would have been, obviously, the curriculum for those people working at level nine, because it's the curriculum to develop the consultant workforce. So they took the curriculum for level nine and sort of diluted it then eight times below that. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about that later on. There was um, an expectation that uh, expressed in the original framework documentation that if you were at level four, you would be expected to be at level four across all of those areas. It was also perceived that the wider workforce would be those people working at the lower levels. Um, and already Andrews um, mentioned the work that was done in England about trying to assess who the wider workforce is. I mean, a GP could be a member of the wider workforce. A local council member, you know, portfolio member, councillor in your local council could be, you know, a real advocate for public health and part of your wider workforce. And they're not operating at junior levels. These are people working at very strategic, quite influential levels. So the idea that the wider workforce are all pitched at the junior end of the, the framework doesn't quite ring true. Um, so, for example, um, I took an NHS health trainer in mind, which is, I know, maybe a work you perhaps don't have in Scotland, but it's a band three, stroke four, um, frontline health promotion, um, lifestyle support worker, maybe a well-being support worker, and looked at what they might be able to do. And of course, we don't get this. It's not linear. You know, they, they're not necessarily at the same level in all of the different areas of practice. They may, they may do, I've put collaborative work in there. Maybe they do a lot of collaborative working at very much a community level, engaging local resources, trying to get organisations together to help support the local community. Um, but they, they won't have a lot of knowledge around health protection. It's not really something that comes into, into play. Um, so the original framework, I think when we went around all the workshops, we came to Scotland, we went to Wales, we went to Northern Ireland, we went to about six regions in England. Um, 
I think it was fairly unanimous that everybody thought that the framework, the original framework, was a really good thing to have. You know, people liked the fact that we had one. So the, the, the idea of having a framework was very much valued. But, you know, eight years down the line, a lot has changed. And so people were thinking it does, it does need to be slightly different. We need it to look different and be different for us to be able to engage with it more, more effectively. And, and this was one of the issues, that, that it's not linear you know, and, and maybe career pathways out there don't, per, you know, people don't percolate automatically with very well worn p career pathways. You know, it's not that clear. It's all, as, as people have already been saying, it's all a little bit more complicated than that. You know, we've got matrix teams and people coming in with a kaleidoscope of skills. You know, actually, it, it's a lot more complicated than maybe this would suggest. So, how did we go about? then reviewing the framework. So I like to call it a listening exercise. So those of you that were here before, um, it's um, it was two years ago, isn't it? Yeah. Unbelievable. So <laughs> I've lived and breathed this for two, at least two years. So um, two years ago, we, we came to Scotland and a lot of other places to say, basically, how do we need to change this? Um, we also did an online survey to support that. And then going back to the skills passport, which was basically how would this work on a digital platform, on a digital interface or a website, we did a little proof of concept with 100 workers. We, we recruited people from councils in the northeast. We recruited um, a community team of health trainers, in fact, in, a, in an NHS community trust, a provider trust. And we engaged a drug and alcohol team, a PHE working in central London. So we had three quite different, diverse teams to test an e-portfolio that we, we just adapted and redesigned uh, to see how they interacted with the original framework. So that, that was really helpful because it, it was a very detailed way of scrutinising that original framework in, in the context of people self-assessing themselves. So that flagged up a whole load of issues that, that, that were really helpful for us to know about. Um, what became very evident, our first workshop was in the east of England, um, in Cambridge, and we engaged somebody there to kick off the workshop from Skills for Health that did a lot of functional mapping. You can do functional mapping for patient pathways, but you, but you can apply, apply it to a number of things. And what became quite evident early on was that if we were going to start describing the public health workforce, then the form of that framework should follow function. It should be form, follow function. So that's, that was the first radical shift that, that we made from the original framework. So the framework, the new one, is about what people do. So because the original framework was about a curriculum, it, there was a lot of emphasis about knowledge. But if you analysed the descriptors, it would be either understand or be aware of. So even the knowledge descriptors, it, it did give you a sense of curriculum, but it, it, there wasn't much in the way of knowing what the different levels of, of knowledge, you know, whether to critically analyse or just to understand. It, it, it was a little unclear. So a lot of people then said we need to... Uh, simplify the language, um, talking about the, the 20 million wider workforce in England or the 2 million perhaps here in Scotland. If we want people to engage with this framework to try and relate with the contributions that they make to public health outcomes, how are they going to relate to that if we're, we've got a framework that's loaded with a lot of technical uh, language or, or specific silos that we have a name for, academic public health health intelligence, you know, if that's the only label, how are we going to expect people to understand how they relate to that? Um, then we, so we redesigned it. This is, the, all of these reports are available on the gov.uk website. So we then redid the redesign. We consulted then on that new design. Um, I did a video on YouTube. We had a PDF uh, placed on Google. And we sent that out with a select survey across the UK and asked people what they thought of the new design. So you can see this, is, this has been a very iterative process. And when I come to talk about the skills passport in a moment and the development of a digital product, this iterative, agile approach to developing a product is very important. So having this interaction with you today is a really valuable part of that, that process. 
So we've also then in our engaged workers and agencies to start experimenting with uh, the potential what we call functionality. So how are we going to use this? So some of you might have the draft user guide, which was a quick and dirty exercise, I have to say, last summer, in August uh, last summer. And this was where we were trying to engage the wider workforce, like the allied health professionals. So we've got the Chartered Institute of uh, Physiotherapists and people like that who have tried to map a typical physio role against the framework to see what are the contributions that they make to public health outcomes. So that, that document, you can have a flick through, is, is a first, first exercise. So I'm not saying that it's definitive, or, but, but it's part of this trying to engage with other professionals uh, and, and our core professional groups to see how, now that we've redesigned the framework, um, which turns out to be quite radically, is this something that's going to be meaningful for you? So, as I say, there are two reports on the gov.uk website. Um, we've got last, in July 2015, we reported on all of those workshops, um, but we also then published a report last November which talks about the redesign and the consultation on the redesign. Uh, and what we came up with. So if you, if you were ever interested in the process that we've gone through to reach this point, it's, it's quite well documented. This is um, a word cloud from that first report, which pretty much summarises the things that we found from, from the workshops that we ran. And you can see Simplify um, looms large. Um, and the, the, where it says competences, I think this is where people were saying, can we just have one descriptor? Can we have fewer descriptors? Um, you will see things like wider, so uh, people were very much mindful of the wider workforce and not just the core workforce. Um, we've got functions, um, we've got clarity, um, levels, it was almost um, quite a, a large consensus there were too many levels. Um, it was very difficult and we found this when we tested the skills passport early, early on. There was it was too vague, the difference between level three and four or between five and, you know, the, 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 it wasn't crystallised enough for people to know where they were. So they spent a lot of time umming and ahhing, thinking, well, I'm not quite sure where I am. Um, links to registration. There's words like frameworks on there, because, of course, we've got a whole plethora of other frameworks. KSF, I know you use that a lot in Scotland, maybe less so south of the border. But, you know, what, where does this fit with the rest of them? Um, so we, there was also an ask about, you know, a clearer purpose for the framework, that that purpose is better articulated, and also ownership. Who, who owns it? I mean, PHE um, are commissioned, you know, we're acting as guardians, if you like, and sort of facilitators for the development of this, but ultimately uh, we're commissioned to do that. It's not, it's not our framework, so how are we going to make sure moving forward that there's somebody that owns and manages and and takes accountability for how this framework now fares in the system. So key changes then, um, I did actually sit down and count them one day. Uh, <laughs> I think I was in bed with my laptop, <laughs> a cup of tea one Sunday morning, thinking I'm going to have to get around to this at some point. Um, so over 700 descriptors in the original framework. So when we were asking people to interact with that and tell us where they were, you can see, you know, a lot of people just looked at you and sort of faintly lost the will to live. Um, so we also had nine levels and the nine areas, as I say, that the uh, multi-dimensional cube, which, which, which is ingenious, really. I mean, you know, it's a, a feat. Um, very neat and uh, very helpful. Um, so we made a few changes and now we have 70 descriptors, which are the sub-functions. One, what we did to get down to 70 was, you probably remember, we had the, I'll call them silos, if you don't mind, just because I think getting out of our silos might be one of the things we might need to think about. Uh, having special, it's, that's, that, that's the challenge, isn't it? That, that we're in silos, but we need experts. So that, that's, that's the, uh, the rub, isn't it, the tension? But we had um, these silos so of course if you were just looking at the health intelligence silo of course 
people working in health intelligence have to communicate. They have to communicate complex data. And then you'd go into the healthcare public health and, well, they'd have to communicate. So what you'd have is descriptors around communication in at least five of the columns. So one of the key principles of the redesign was, if we're going to say anything, we will say it only once. So we just took the communication descriptors out. So you'd have to go to the area around what we're now calling data and management and We've taken the Ron seal effect, if I'm allowed to mention a particular manufacturer, but it's each box now is it does what it says on the tin. So we've been trying to explain the front of the tin about what the functions are inside the tin. So you've got you've now got 13 tins, if you like. So you've got 13 functions describing public health activity, 70 functions which are only uh, which are exclusive, they're only explained once, so we've got it down to 70 descriptors. Beneath that, there are over 350 national occupational standards mapped, but we don't, you know, you can, if you want that, you can go and find it and the work's been done, but we don't present that as part of the framework, because again, we're back to possibly something unwieldy. So what we've tried to do is make sure there's enough information um, presented as succinctly as possible to help people to find it accessible and, and easier to interact with. So this is what it looks like. So we have the overall function because we have levels of functionality. Then we've got three areas, um, and I'll explain that, I'll go back. Um, part of this, the, the other rub, is that public health, we want to be everybody's business. But then at the same time, we want people to understand what it is to be a specialist in public health. So while we want everybody to embrace the public health agenda and work towards public health outcomes, we, we still also want people to appreciate that there are specialist skills involved in this and that, that you know, there is, there is a workforce for whom this is a career and, and who, who can provide a lot of expert advice around how to do this to, to best effect, to deliver to public health outcomes. So, thinking also about other corporate frameworks, I mean, we've got 152 councils, probably all with their own competency framework. We've got the PHE civil service competency framework. So, things like leadership, a lot of organize, employing organisations have got that covered. They've got their online training, they've got their own competency framework in, in their organisation dealing with what you might call more generic, more transferable skills. So what we've tried to do is identify those skills that are very much the specialty areas of people that work in public health careers and those areas that we, we most likely share with a lot of other people are transferable. And for some people that's the way that they come into a public health career. They come in through the transferable skill set and then they have to learn the, the more technical skills. So it was a way of trying to acknowledge that there's a wider workforce and people coming and joining us in the public health family through maybe some of their transferable skills, but there is this core of highly technical skills that they then need to learn. And this is part of your assessment of staff that you recruit. You know, every worker comes in with maybe a unique skill set. How do they how do we assess what that is? How do we identify where they may have a couple of blind spots? And then how do we make sure that they are upskilled so that they are a complete public health professional or worker? So having said that we're, we're trying to describe on the outside of the tin what it does inside the tin, I'll just shorthand it for you. So A1 is about measure, monitor and report population health and well-being. So that sounds a little bit like data, surveillance, health intelligence, doesn't it? Then we've got A2, promote population and community health and well-being, addressing the wider determinants. So there's your more health improvement, health promotion box, if you like. A3, protect the public from environmental hazards, communicable disease and other health risks and inequalities and risk exposure. So there's your health protection tin if you want to find something a little bit more uh, comfortable to start with if that's your area of expertise. A4 is working to and for the evidence base, so that's all around your research, evidence-based practice. And then you've got function A5 to audit, evaluate and redesign services and interventions. So that's where your healthcare public health comes in, where you're 
um, analysing services, assessing new technologies, looking at how health services are commissioned and provided. Um, we did have, uh, we've used lots of experts, lots of networks, um, lots of professional groups uh, to help with the descriptors with this, but we've also went to the Institute of Health Equity at the University of Central London, the Michael Marmot's office, and they've gone through every single descriptor with us, so hence you will see um, a regular repetition to, um, uh, to, uh, and reference to health inequalities. Uh, which we feel should be throughout the framework. It's it's not um, it's not the work of the people in health improvement. Everybody across all domains of public health should be mindful of inequalities, service access, exposure to risks, building on floodplains, whatever it is. Um, context. This is where we've got the transferable skills and the context in which people work. So that's the st strategic and policy context. Uh, that's the organisational context, working collaboratively across boundaries. That's, um, and, and this is m maybe an Anglo-centric thing uh, about commissioning, but I, I do think that probably all the countries in the UK are commissioning in some degree, um, if not in health and in social care. Uh, so it's about how do you uh, stay true to your public health principles and values while in a maybe a business working in a business environment, a commercial environment. Um, and then the fourth area is about working in a political and democratic environment. So um, NHS, I do believe, is a highly politicised organisation. Uh, but of course, in England, we're also now working in local government where we've got local politics and we're also working in the civil service in Public Health England. So again, that's another uh, set of political um, considerations that we may need to be making in, in the work that we're doing. So being aware of that, um, th there were quite a few references to both, I mean there have been references, I didn't have to go far to try and develop the descriptors around this. In the original framework there was reference to political, working in a political environment and working around commissioning. So even though we've brought, pulled some things out to give them sharper focus, we, we, there's, there's nothing that wasn't in the original framework, not really. It was just harder to find. Um, we did separate, the, why we've gone from 9 to 13, we separated collaboration and leadership. Um, a lot of people in the workshop said, um, I don't feel that I'm in a position of leadership, but I collaborate all the time. And you can have collaborative leadership, collaborative research, collaborative commissioning. So we decided to take collaboration out and make it an independent set of descriptors um, which I sort of slightly lived to regret in fact because when I came to try and formulate some descriptors around collaborative working I found that I couldn't find any consistency in any set of standards any curricula um, ended up going to the literature got a couple of books spoke to a couple of university lecturers only to find that the only consensus when it comes to collaborative working is that there's no consensus. So um, that became quite a major part of the work in the redesign was how do we describe the skill set and, and what actually it is that we do when we work collaboratively. So that, that was a very interesting process and one of the descriptors in there is about evaluating partnerships. So you know, is there a lot of partnership working and collaborative working that we're doing that actually is not adding any value to what we're doing but seems to be taking an awful lot of our time. So there is an, there is an expectation within the framework now that when you're working collaboratively, you're actually evaluating the effectiveness of that activity. So that, that's slightly different, um, but I do pick up the point that Andrew made that leadership is at all levels. So even though people said they didn't feel they were in a, a position of leadership, so we've tried to capture that in the descriptors around leadership. So we've got four areas of delivery, providing leadership, and there are five levels, uh, five descriptors within those with about leading self, leading others, leading change, leading systems, providing vision. So um, most people within the workforce will identify with, with at least one of those. Um, we've got communicate with others to improve health. So of course we're all communicators. It's supposed to be one of the key 
pillars of strength of people in public health that we, we can engage and communicate with others on a whole host of levels. We've got design and manage programmes and projects. This was another message that we got from the workforce that a lot of them have been, you know, a lot of their work revolves around project and programme management, but they can't see that skill set described in the original framework. So again, we've brought that out. Um, and, and we know, working in PHE in the civil service, that project and programme management skills are in real shortage across all of the public sector and in particularly um, government departments. It's a huge issue. So there is a pan um, civil service programme management group that come together uh, to, because they're trying to build that capacity within public service and they've had a look at the framework so we've had their advice on, on what that should say. And finally we've got um, to prioritise and manage resources at a population uh, systems level. So three of those are around finance money or um, other assets, property. The other three are around workforce where we're looking at capability, competence and capacity and those three things. There's a little glossary at the back of the framework document on your tables so those three things are explained and I think you picked them up Andrew in your presentation. So the idea is now that we have a framework with the 70 descriptors on organised into 13 buckets if you like and the idea is that individuals come to this and um, map themselves and they use the framework like a menu. So um, this is partly because so, so many of us have our own unique skill set because we've come from all sorts of different places and we do such a variety of roles within the public health workforce. So you go to the framework and as a menu you draw down those descriptors that, that relate or reflect what you do to best effect. So for example this community worker may have those technical skills. Um, influencing and strengthening community action by empowering communities through evidence-based approaches. They may be identifying data needs and obtaining, verifying and organising that data to help to inform their practice. And they may be facilitating change, could be behavioural or cultural, in organised communities or individuals. So that could be working with individuals about behaviour change or it could be trying to change the behaviours of a, of a group or an organisation or a, um, a charity. Um, they in their um, shared um, transferable skill set around context. They may be developing and implementing action plans from policies and strategies. They may be helping individuals and communities to have more control over decisions that affect them. So that will be part of the engaging with maybe their local MP or their local councillor um, and the whole democratic system that communities um, are part of. Um, and then they may connect communities, groups and individuals to local resources and services. So this may be about them getting them in touch with the CAB or somebody locally. And they build alliances and partnerships to plan and, and, and implement programmes where maybe several organisations in their community share the same goals. And then finally, they might um, they have the deliverable skill sets where they, they may be facilitating dialogue um, and, and working on health literacy uh, and this is the only one descriptor that every single person should have from the framework and that is to act with integrity, consistency and purpose and continue my own personal development and that is the first rung of the leadership descriptors to lead self. So just to say that every one of those descriptors in the framework can either be prefixed with I so if somebody's self-assessing, they could say, I do this or I don't. Similarly, if you're writing a job description, you can prefix it with two. I would like somebody to be able to do this. So that's a consistent design throughout the framework. So the framework as a product, what, what are we hoping to have? Um, these are the uh, just an indication of the, the number of employers that might be wanting to engage with it. We're looking to get endorsement partners, and the original framework had some. A lot of them were royal colleges, a lot of them were um, medical practitioner organisations. What we're going to do now, um, and we're working on, is trying to engage people like um, the Royal Institute of Town Planning, housing, uh, professional bodies, um, transport, leisure, to try and embrace a much wider range of organisations to reflect the wider determinants. Uh, so that's part of the work that we want to be doing. And, you know, you may have these links, certainly, Andrew, with the housing community here in Scotland. If 
use the framework to open a dialogue with them and if they want to endorse the framework and embrace it, if it helps them to express what they do in terms of public health, that could be helpful. The original framework, uh, a conscious decision was made when they were writing the original framework not to include anything to do with public health ethics. And that was because they felt that that was addressed somewhere else. One very clear message we got from all our workshops was that people would like some better guidance around public health ethics. Possibly because there was so much disruption in the system, and I'm, I know you're very much in a fluid place here in Scotland, so people were looking for something central around um, ethical practice that they could refer to. So we've commissioned a couple of ethicists uh, to write a paper um, to, to underpin the framework and that it's not quite on the gov.uk website yet but at any minute now so you've got Scotland has got the most recent iteration there on your tables um, and we're hoping to get that on the, uh, the framework website within the next two weeks. Um, We've got a period of purdah coming up uh, in England because of local government elections. So if I don't get it in the next 10 days, it may have to wait until May. But any, so I'm, that's one of my on my to do list. Um, case studies, and we'll talk about those, I think, throughout the day. And you've got a couple of examples uh, and indicative role templates again. So what we're looking to do is to now furnish the framework with uh, examples to help people to see how it can be applied. And so, you know, we. We're reliant now on the, at this stage, people like yourselves to, to have a go. Um, the, the framework has been published um, as an as a organisation neutral document, so even though it's on the PHE website, it's, we've tried to make sure that it's, um, it, it's neutral so that all the home nations feel um, ownership of that. We did develop an area around professional uh, professional and ethical underpinnings. Um, a lot of it's around the Nolan principles, codes of conduct, mandatory training, and some ethical guidance. Um, there's the paper that's on your tables that's almost published, but not quite. So we've got something to support that. And I don't know if any of you are aware that the faculty in the UK PHR revised the Good Public Health Practice Framework, which is on the faculty um, website. That was published in 2016. So that's um, a very good amalgam of um, uh, codes of conduct and principles of practice, which is easy to find. So how, how is it being used? How am I doing for time? Sorry, am I? It, it's, I think people are happy just to continue for a few minutes. I won't, I'll just be a couple of minute, more minutes. Really important. Okay. Um, so in PHE, what we are doing for the next 12 months is we're putting the framework, I've designed a self-assessment form against the framework, and we're putting that into the appraisal process. So um, it's, it's not mandatory, it's not, it's not that everybody has to do it, because of course, um, like with your organisations, we have business managers and project managers, and they're, they're in the organisation, but they're not uh, pursuing what they would perceive to be a public health career. So... Uh, even though there are transferable skills, but um, we do have an awful lot of people who ha are pursuing a, a public health career. So if they want to use the framework, uh, they can, and they can have that, what we are calling career conversations with their line managers. Um, so uh, this is a test to see if our line managers see it as a useful tool to engage in that conversation uh, and to see if individuals find it useful. So that's just an example of the form that we've developed. We've got a profile on a slide, and I think you've, I've sent some on for you to have tabled. Uh, we had a nurse consultant uh, mapped against the framework, got a community development worker. In the user guide, you can see how speech therapists, dietitians have mapped themselves against it to see how that works. So we've got profiles on a slide, and that's literally the, the menu. So it's very top level. Then we've got profiles with examples. Um, I have done one against the UK PHR practitioner standards, so that's on your tables if you want to have a look to see how that pans out. But also, um, for example, we've got the CPHVA to map the health visitor role against it, uh, which they've done. So that they select the function. So that these prof if there's a function they don't think they deliver on, they've taken that out. So. Um, 
you will see the functions that they feel they relate to and the sub-functions in particular and what we've asked them to do is a given example of what is it about the work that they do demonstrates that, that this is how they're active in this regard. So they've done that now for school nurses as well. Um, I've had voluntary agencies do it, breastfeeding volunteer organisations have done it. Um, then we've got indicative role templates, and again, these, these are on your tables, and this is more about the core workforce. So the indicative role templates are more about trying to get um, something together that gives an indication, for example, of what a health protection practitioner does, as opposed to a health intelligence practitioner or a health improvement practitioner. So we're, we're working with these specific professional groups within PHE at the moment for them to start mapping this process. Um, then we'll go out wider uh, across the whole organisation and then we'll go out wider to you guys. So this, this is something that through Fiona here and through her counterparts in Wales and Ireland, we'll, we'll start moving this out to see if we can get something that resonates with everyone. Um, some of you might be aware that on the Skills for Health website, they've got a couple of these on the NHS Employers website. They've got, um, they've got profiles to help with job evaluation. Um, we're not going to go down that road. Uh, this was one of the problems with the original framework that we picked up in the workshops, and that was that because it was so aligned to nine levels, even though they're not the same thing, People link those immediately to the Agenda for Change bans. People had had their jobs evaluated against the framework and they'd possibly been downgraded. So there were quite a few people out there with negative associations with the framework because it made them lose money uh, and, and put them at a different banding. Those numbers, those levels were never meant to represent the bans in the first place. Um, but also we had a lot of requests that the, that the levels, uh, there were too many. You couldn't distinguish between the levels that clearly. Um, and some people said, why do we need levels? So um, the indicative role templates talk about how different organisations evaluate jobs. And that is a local issue. And I noticed that, Andrew, on your slide about this is what employers do. If we're talking about T's and C's and bandings, that's a local issue that's between you and your employer. You know, we're, we're never going to get a framework that says everybody should be earning this in every single country and this is what they should be doing. We cannot be prescriptive in that way. And I think, I, I do understand that a lot of people, if they use the original framework in that way, they do find the new framework really rather loose. Um, you know, so if you have a preference for something that sets out, I say rules for want of a better word, but is more prescriptive about who should be where doing what and paid what, this is not what the framework is. That's not the nature of the tool. So these indicative role templates will talk to you, um, hopefully, it's there for consultation, around what are the issues that you settle locally. This, these are issues between you and your employer. But in terms of developing your career in public health, you might want to be sure that you cover all the bases, um, which is what happens through the practitioner standards and the specialist standards that, that people are assessed against for professional registration. It's the breadth, for people to understand the breadth, to see where they fit in the public health family. So they lift their gaze from their day-to-day -day job and look around and say, where am I, where do I sit within the whole public health family? So that's the indicative role templates. Again, work in progress. So this is all about the iterative you know, agile way of developing the tool. We've got local authorities conducting skills audits and we've got training providers aligning qualifications. We had um, a presentation at the London launch from Leeds University that's mapping a degree programme. Um, and we've got service providers highlighting the public health functions they deliver. So I've just put this one in. The, um, this is an organisation called the Soil Association who did a really great presentation at our London launch of the framework. It's a voluntary organisation. Um, it's been commissioned to deliver healthy eating programmes in most of the schools in England. And it's been commissioned to do that by the National Lottery. So there's not a public health specialist in sight. 
So they are absolutely thrilled with the framework because they go in. They really pride themselves on the fact that they evaluate everything that they do, and they think they're making a useful contribution to the evidence base. And now they've got descriptors that they can pick out of the framework to show that that's what they do. So they're thrilled to bits with this, and they and I think you know I think the Soil Association probably has some work going on in Scotland. Yep. So. Um, that, that they really have appreciated the framework. They, they, it helps, they see it as more, they can be more conversant about their skill sets around public health. And interesting, the, U, the university in Leeds was saying that because the language has changed so much in the framework, they find that that resonates a lot better with employers because there's a lot more pressure now on universities. You know, they're measured by, you know, the output, how many people do they get into, into work. So, um, and of course, that, uh, another area of work that I'm moving into is the apprenticeship agenda. So, you know, it means the framework is going to lend itself much more readily now to the development of apprenticeship standards because the language is, is uh, more res resonates better with uh, the wider world. So, what's the future? Um, Andrew's mentioned the skills passport. The future is digital. I don't know how things are moving up here in Scotland, but uh, we've got... Um, to do everything digital by default pretty much now through um, through certainly Public Health England. This is, if you go on to the gov.uk website and the government digital service, it makes it very clear what the uh, direction of travel and the journey is that you have to go on if you're going to develop a digital asset. Um, we're not actually, we've been advised not to call it the skills passport anymore because a skills passport is a product. And we don't know if that's the product that we actually need because we're going through a journey of discovery through the digital process, which is iterative and agile. So we've just commissioned a discovery phase, which is the one on the far left. To uh, And we have done a survey through the, the organisation that we commissioned to do this discovery phase. And that survey reached over 900 uh, public health workers and they interviewed people. They came to our launch and got over 60 user stories from people like yourselves to work out what, what would this digital service around the framework need to provide. So the skills passport is moving into being a digital service and so that would be a key implementation tool for the framework. Um, and while you're quite right, Andrew, when we were talking about the skills passport, it was very Anglo-centric. This was something we thought well, England would be doing. But, of course, you put that out in the, on the World Wide Web. You know, it, why is not everybody? I mean, we could have people in Holland, America. You know, we, there's no, you don't have control over that. If it's free access, you know, people could be using this all over the world. So we're, much, we're becoming much more mindful about how could this help people in Scotland? How could it help people in Northern Ireland? Uh, and Wales. So that's that's broadening because that could be a key, key delivery tool. So that's the research that was, was carried out, um, that they had a number of different research methods. And the insights that they got from that, which is literally just we've just learned, is that people felt there was a strong need to have a digital service around this. So we've got the go ahead to go to the next stage. So that's that's sort of as much as I can give you without you lapsing into a coma, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs>